Andrew Sears. I'm, you know, one of the co-founders. I'm the president of City Vision University, and Mike Prung is. Um, he has had um, many hats. He's currently the digital learning architect at Azusa Pacific, and uh, really helps them a lot with their online education program and their instructional design. Um, and he also is. Um, is your title dean at? The Union University of, of California? Uh, I, I'm the uh, chief academic officer there. Okay, yeah. And that is a, a university that is largely focused on um, serving in Vietnam and um, is a DEAC accredited school. And uh, Mike is one of my uh, gurus, Uber gurus that I go to <laughs> on instructional design. Um, so, uh, and, and Mike, maybe you could talk about you know, the, the purpose of this presentation and, you know, why you pulled this together and thought this would be useful for folks. Sure. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for being here and joining us. Uh, this presentation was actually um, initially uh, a presentation I, I, I prepared for another organization. It's the International Council of Higher Education, which is led by Kevin Manoya. Some of you may know him. Uh, and that's an international group. And I did this for them initially when I you know, was asked um, by Kevin about doing this workshop. COVID was not in the picture at all. This is back in January. He just wanted me to talk about sort of higher education and online learning in general. And then all of a sudden, obviously, COVID uh, took place in the US. And by mid-March, this uh, online thing sort of became the go-to for most schools. And and obviously, what I had prepared, I had to re basically revamp the whole thing. and. Uh, and so I did this presentation for uh, international group uh, about a month ago, and and I just found the the conversation that we had so engaging and and so um, uh, relevant for our time. I just thought, you know, maybe this is something that would be useful for Chia for this group for a domestic kind of audience. And so that's why you know I, I was talking with Andrew and making you know sort try of trying to see if this is something that would be useful and. And I'm glad you know some of you are able to join us. And I I hope you know, a lot of the the conversations will be the really the rich part of what we will be doing today. Uh, we have a small enough group that we really can have a conversation. I, I'll present some ideas, but really we would you know we really would welcome uh, more of a conversation. And so I will. Um, maybe get started and uh, I will see, I see people kind of coming in. So I don't know, Andrew, if you have that right to kind of admit people, so I don't have to. Yeah, yeah, admit. I'm doing that okay, as so, they come in. And then also if you, uh, Andrew, if you can help monitor the chat and things like that, that would be also okay, helpful for sure. me and I can just focus on the content. So um, I'll just start with uh, a couple of um, words about words because words matter. Uh, when. When COVID-19 hit, I think what happened with people uh, and institutions moving their courses to a virtual environment was really, it's a, what they call emergency remote learning. Uh, that was really what was happening. And uh, when you talk about emergency remote uh, learning, it's this sort of ap haphazard, ad hoc, I'd say low quality and to sort of really low preparation. And that's really what happened a lot of, uh, at a lot of schools during the spring. Um, that's really different than what we typically refer to as online, you know, which has a lot more uh, preparation, a lot more considerations about how the, the content in the course is designed and delivered. And so I think those are important distinctions. Uh, it's also important to kind of look at the history of how online learning has evolved. Uh, I, I did some research and you know, when, when we talk about online learning and its origins, you know, we can actually look back to the 1800s, you know, this, this concept of a correspondence courses actually existed there. And I, I would say even further back before that, maybe you want to look at the Bible and how Paul wrote his letters to the churches and he would send those out. And I mean, it wasn't a, a correspondence uh, course, but it was a way that people, that he was able to communicate content to an audience for them to kind of consider so you can see there the history of how online learning has evolved over the years. Uh, you know, e-learning was sort of the term in the the 2000, and then I would say since you know 2010, 
we use the word online learning more often. And really, when we talk about online learning, we're talking about sort of synchronous, uh, uh, you know, what we're doing right now, and then asynchronous, which is, I think, more common when it comes to online learning. And then, obviously, the massive open online courses that many of you are familiar with. So those are, I think, just you know, key differentiating uh, terms that I think are important to keep in mind as we go on. Uh, so on, on March uh, 20th, so this is about you know, a week or so into the COVID uh, shutdown, at least in California, um, there, there was a group of, of thinkers, I would say. You know, that, 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 so this is Andy Crouch, is a former uh, editor of Christianity Today, and he and his colleagues um, were at the uh, Praxis Lab, and they wrote an article I thought was very profound in terms of how they understood the event. And so what they said was that COVID-19 can be seen as a one-time event. It can be seen as a season. It also can be seen as an era. So uh, think of you know, a blizzard as the event. You know, you, when a blizzard happens, you can't go out. There's zero visibility, and the conditions are just hostile. And your main goal is just to just hunker down and just wait it out. And typically a bl blizzard would be like a day or two or maybe a week long. And that's sort of how COVID-19 was initially. Uh, people thought, okay, we just need to hunker down for a few days or a, a, few, a, a week or so, and then it'll be over. But then obviously it wasn't just a few days or a week. It, you know, it became longer. And this is where they argue that it, it actually maybe it is a season where, you know, like, you know, when when you transition from a blizzard to a winter season, <clears throat> your mindset has to change because it's no longer just trying to hunker down. You're trying to say, okay, how do I have to make changes to my daily activities, to the, just my, my, my life, you know, to adjust to this new season of doing things. Um, the uncertainty of COVID-19 kind of uh, made a lot of the, the schools in the U.S. and abroad uh, really trying to prepare for you know, not just you know, the rest of the spring semester or a term that we're finishing up, but also about the summer because you know, uh, we're you know, in the midst of summer sessions and how do we do that, deal with that? Um, and, you know, and Andy Crouch and, and them also said that, well, maybe it's not just a season. Maybe what COVID-19 is the beginning of is an era, you know, what they would call the little <clears throat> in a mini ice age. And they cite an example in 1816. Uh, they say the year without a summer. So in a Mount Tambora, which is in modern day Indonesia, there was a, a volcano eruption that uh, basically um, led to a, uh, a ash plume that kind of uh, circulated around the world and it reduced solar radiation. It caused sort of widespread crop um, failures, it, it decreased the temperature in the world. I mean, it was a sort of a, this global event that happened. And many countries you know, across Europe and across North America actually did not experience a summer that year. Uh, and, and in many ways, they argue that the 1816 event uh, you know, was the beginning of uh, almost like a several year, if not a, a decade long a reduction in temperature uh, for the northern hemisphere um, of the world. And, and they make that parallel in saying that COVID-19 could be one of those events where it will forever change how we live and how we learn uh, going forward. And you can start to see some of the signs of this already. Uh, this comes from MindWires. Um, this is a really, I think, great uh, infographic kind of illustrating the different transition plans that different schools in North America are starting to think about for the fall. APU just made an announcement last week that we are <clears throat> going to do uh, in class, in person, sort of on the right side of this diagram. And <clears throat> I don't know how how well thought out that is uh, because you now there are going to be uh, challenges with when it comes to the large lecture classes how are they going to keep that you know without uh, keep those large lecture classes uh, while adhering to social distancing kind of guidelines and so on but you know some schools like the California community colleges and the California state colleges they have said you know what for the fall semester we're just going to go online we're not even going to consider going in person because it's not uh it's just not certain and, and what about you know, the next outbreak how is that going to impact us and so you know schools are kind of all over the place uh, in the country in terms of 
where they are and uh, how they plan on opening in the fall. This concept of the Iron Triangle is something that is often talked about in higher ed literature. You know, this concept of how do we uh, increase access to students, you know, educating more students. Uh, at the same time, how do we reduce costs and also how do we improve quality? You know, so how do we do more with, uh, how do we, yeah, do more with less and better, more, less, better. And, and some have argued, and, and I would be in this camp that you know, online has been sort of this answer to this iron triangle for many, many years, but you know, very few people very few people have listened or in, until now. And I think in that many ways, the COVID-19, of all the things in the world I thought would be an advocate for online learning, I never thought it would be a virus. But now it has, no, it has become the biggest uh, advocate for online learning in a way that I never would have imagined. Um, if you look at the uh, distance ed enrollment, you know, sort of online enrollment in the United States, this is the latest figures from iPads, and you can see that about a third of undergraduate students uh, have taken at least one online course. You know, this is based on the 2018 um, uh, report of, of the iPads number. And then among the graduate students, it's a little higher. You know, and we, we know this because a lot of the adult students, you know, they are you know, the ones that are looking for more flexible, more um, uh, accessible model when it comes to a more additional education. And so that's something that we, um, we, we know about. And this is a, uh, the sort of the, the bell curve that typically is used to talk about how technology is adopted. Um, you know, on the left side is where you see the early, you know, the early market where the innovators and early adopters and then there's a chasm, the great chasm, and then there's then the rest of you know, the, the world. And I would say that in the pre-COVID-19, online learning was really reserved for the early market or the innovators and early adopters. Even at APU, uh, you know, we've been doing online learning, I would say, since uh, the early 2000. I think our first program was in 2004, 2005, you know, with our education technology program. And, and yet for 15 or so years, online learning is still only about 10% of our campus is offering. You know, it's very, very few, uh, small compared to the, you know, our on, on, camp, on campus in-person courses. And so I'd say even a big school like APU, you know, we've been doing online for a long time and yet it's still a very small part of what we do. Uh, but then COVID-19 happened and I think this is where online becomes sort of the, the majority crowd will come in. Uh, Jeffrey Moore has a book called The Crossing the Chasm. He argues that um, that gap between the early adopters and the rest of the market, and that's really the hardest, you know, chas that chasm is the hardest to, to overcome. And if you can break through that, then that's where, you know, you can start seeing amazing sort of, um, sort of scale that, that can happen. And I think that's where um, online learning is today, is it's, it's now confronted, uh, confronting every schools and administrators and faculty and students. And this is where I got my title um, from the, <laughs> Disney cartoon of Hercules. You might have kids uh, who uh, enjoy this uh, uh, movie. And basically, it's about this is a song about how Hercules went from a nobody to a somebody. And that's how I think I see online learning during this uh, event. And so, in the remaining time, what I want to do is sort of cover these five topics. Um, they're really big topics, and I could probably spend an hour, all of us could spend an hour talking about each of these things, but I really want to give a broad stroke um, uh, kind of overview of how these different topics are really critical to how we are going to understand and, and in some of our positions implement online learning or scale online learning at our individual institution. So I, I think it's um, obviously it's not going to be comprehensive, but I think it hopefully will get us started in some of the converse, important conversations. And at the end of each section, I have uh, sort of discussion questions that you know, we can focus on. And I, I hope that you know, what today's uh, webinar does is it gives you some 
uh, some of the language and some of the, the, the issues and, and themes that you can then start conversations at your own campus, you know, about things that I think are critical to, to what you guys are facing. So let's get started and talk about sort of leadership. So the topic of leadership and online learning has been around for over two decades. I mean, if you look in the literature, it's there. And, and you know, going back to you know, one, one particular study, you know, talks, talking about the, the role of leaders uh, in online learning, you know, it says that it, it is an uh, essential role in the new century. This is you know, the 1999 article. Um, and during the early days, you know, online learning really didn't have many allies, uh, let alone any focus or attention among the senior leadership. Online learning really didn't warrant a place in the organizational structure or any institutional plan. Uh, and that's where now they care and, and Scallon was arguing that we, we really need to, to start to embed online learning into the infrastructure, into the identity and the, the way we we, we do uh, higher ed. Um, there's a great book, you know, about best practices in online program development. I would recommend if you have not read it, and if you are an administrator at your school and or you're tasked with trying to uh, either start, uh, develop, or grow, or scale online learning, this is a great book. It, it kind of gives you kind of the nitty gritty of how to do that, you know, almost like a step-by-step -step process. And uh, they, they they argue that you know, one of the first steps and the, and the most important step is you have to get the, the institution to buy in you know, to, to the effort. Uh, if you don't do that, it's almost you know, dead on arrival because uh, without that institutional backing and the leadership support, it, it just won't go anywhere. And I think that's true. That's one of the reasons I would argue at AP why online learning has not really grown and developed much because the leadership, you know, from the president to the provost to the, the deans, no, there has not really been an advocate for online learning. And that's where, you know, why we kind of see it, it's sort of, it's stalled, uh, being stalled at AP for a while. Uh, Chloe is a, a great report that you probably need to look at, start looking at if you want to really look into the leadership development of online learning. So basically, uh, Chloe stands for the changing landscape of online education. You know, every year they come out with a report. This is their fourth one. And um, they, they, they say that there is no clearer sign of leadership buy-in uh, for online learning than the existence of a senior level position, such as a chief online learning officer. So a chief online learning officer is something that a COO is, uh, is actually becoming more of a, uh, not a common, but it's emerging role. So in the 360 institutions that are represented in their survey this year, um, you know, th there is at least you know, one person at each of those schools that kind of either function in that role or has that you know, role in, in the senior leadership. And I, also I would point out at other schools, you now you might hear you know, positions like you know, associate provost for digital learning or associate provost for uh, online learning or vice provost for technology and, and then learning and so on. So I would say just the, the idea of having a senior leadership position focus on online is again, very critical to the, the advancement of online learning at your school. Uh, and the question then is like, what, what are the responsibilities of a COO? Uh, what do they do? And what are some of their kind of skill sets? And here you can see on the table, uh, some of the things that they will really need to focus on are things like faculty training, instructional design, quality assurance, uh, you know, student orientation, you know, strategic planning. I mean, th some of those things that are, are I think just bread and butter to what online learning entails. Uh, and there's also sort of some of the co-responsibilities that may um, overlap with some of the other responsibilities on campus, like things like you know, regulatory compliance and technical support and accessibility and open education um, resources. So I think Again, I, I feel like there's so much more I can talk about, but no, I just have to kind of stop there and, and kind of give, uh, give a close, uh, cap this off and then move on to the next section. So here are just some, some topic uh, questions for you to consider at your campus uh, in terms of, you know, is there someone in a leadership position and you know, that is an advocate for online? Uh, is there some sort of uh, discussions about how does online fit into the mission or the operation or the strategy of, of your current structure? And, and also, are there kind of this integration of 
uh, services and support for students who are you know taking online uh, courses or, or programs at your school so that I will um, then move on to talking about technology and um, technology is again one of those what big unwieldy topics when it comes to online because there's so many ways you can approach this and so what I want to do really is talk about two big two big areas. Uh, the first is this idea of the digital divide. And I think uh, this is the go this goes without saying that, you know, the COVID-19 really exposed where the gaps were in terms of uh, our students' access to technology and computing devices. Uh, here you can see this. So this one, uh, these um, uh, tables here uh, come from the Pew Research Center. Uh, this is a more really recent, it's just earlier this year, right before COVID. And I'm sure, you know, they've probably done something since then. But you can see here that, you no, know, oftentimes, um, students or people's general access to either the internet or computing devices are, be, are based on their income level uh, and or their uh, ethnic uh, racial background. And you can see here, you know, the, the, the wealthier you are, the more access you have to these, to these things. And, and obviously the less uh, wealthy, the less you have. And, and same thing when it comes to the, uh, there's a the, sort of the, the breakdown in terms of adoption, the technology adoption among blacks and Hispanics owning sm smartphones compared to the white counterparts. Uh, I mean, it's substantial enough that if you think about uh, if a school had sort of a typical face-to-face -face, uh, sort of way of doing things, all of a sudden moved to an online and, and you are a poor student or worse, you are a poor uh, minority student, then your ability to access and to engage at the same level is just not the same as everybody else or as, as those who have the, the access and, and those who do have the, the devices. And so I think uh, this is something that it's, it's always going to be an issue uh, and something that we need to constantly pay attention to as we do online on our campus. And, and I recognize that you know, there are some, like Andrew, a, a school, City Vision, it's fully online university and some of your schools might be also in that case. But I would say even in online, for online schools, that's still a concern because students may have access to the internet, but maybe it's not reliable or maybe it's not fast enough, you know, depending on how the courses are designed, if there's very heavy in media and they, they're limited in their data plan or they're limited in whatever devices that may not you know, be able to process the, the, the media, then that's also a concern. So um, just you know, something that I think is always important to keep in mind and, and talk we need to talk about that as leaders uh, in the world. Uh, just real quick, this is something that uh, at APU that I kind of brought attention to our leadership doing, you know, when we had to kind of quickly do the emergency remote teaching, as I said, you know, there, there are resources from the governments and nonprofits that, you know, can help students if they don't have access, they, they have to move home and they don't have access to internet or they have limited access. And this is something that um, some of you may be familiar with, you know, keep, uh, keep Americans Connected. And there were uh, over 750 companies and associations that made a pledge uh, to kind of uh, either provide or and or extend uh, technology um, uh, access for students who are in families who weren't able to afford it or for whatever reason. So uh, there's also, I think, this uh, plethora of technology to consider when it comes to online learning and, and just, I would say, the ed tech world in general. Um, and this is where I think the, the chief information officer and maybe the chief online learning officer uh, will have to work together to make decisions about what technology is critical and uh, what is needed. Uh, people oftentimes you know, refer to technology folks as plumbers, uh, meaning you know, they only get uh, brought into the discussion when something is broken. Sort of like, you know, you only call a plumber when you have a leak or when you have an issue with the pipes. Uh, other than that, you don't really need them. You kind of just keep them on, on, the, uh, on your uh, directory. And instead, I think what we need to do is start involving the CIO and, and the technology folks as part of, as a strategist, as part of the the conversation that needs to happen in terms of how will the institution move forward in their decision making about what technology to adopt and and, and how to adopt it because otherwise without that 
important conversation and that role. It just becomes a, you know, a lot of the decisions, I, I see this at my institution, uh, how they adopt technology is they just sort of, you know, group of senior leaders, they, they're in their room and it's based on pitches they've heard from vendors or from their colleagues in another school and they start making decisions about which technology you use and 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 I'm just kind of scratching my head like why are you doing that there's no really thought about the integration and it just yeah there's just a lot of problems that are or I see that at, at my institution um, there's also I think this is the 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 second sort of besides the digital divide, a second topic I want us to kind of really think about is uh, this idea of the open program uh, management model, the OPM as they call it. So OPM for those who are not familiar is a model, it's a, it's a model for helping institutions quickly transition to an online offering without uh, having the infrastructure, the internal uh, infrastructure. So, for example, you know, when if you know, you're a, a small school and you've only offered in-person classes and programs, and COVID-19 happens, and you realize, oh, we really need to offer some of our, our programs online, but you don't have instructional designers, you don't have technologists, you don't have a senior leader, you don't have any of these basic kind of building blocks to offer this. Uh, and more than that, uh, it typically takes you no know, months, if not years, to build an online program. I think Andrew and I can relate here. It just takes a lot of work to build an online program, or at least a quality one. And so what some of the schools have done is they started turning to these uh, OPMs, you know, these managers you know, that will essentially come alongside as vendors and they help schools um, build these programs. Uh, a lot of times it's not building it from scratch. It's like they have these sort of white label type uh, programs that they've built for other schools that they just slap your, your school's logo and your school's kind of feel and look to it and, and then maybe uh, tweak some of the ways that if you're a faith-based school, then they allow you to do some sort of faith integration in it. Uh, but the, the idea is that these, these OPMs can you know, launch a new online program for your school in as quick as like, you know, two or three months. I, I've heard like one, I, um, I was just looking at uh, a vendor, I think it, um, they can do it in, in 100 days, they promise. <laughs> From zero, no, from zero to hero in 100 days, and and you, know, you can see there's so many. That's a, a market that is quickly emerging, and the way a lot of them do it is they would do a revenue sharing where the schools would have little to almost no upfront costs, but then in exchange, then the schools would then share the revenue with these vendors, you know, at upwards of you know 70, 80, maybe even 90 percent of the revenue for you know, whatever the first duration of the contract. Sometimes it can be up to like 10 years, but the for the school you know they they oftentimes say well that's a uh, that's a faustian deal that i can de live with because i currently have zero revenue for online and to get 10 percent of our new program is still 10 percent more than what i currently have and so i think some of them will you know are willing to make that deal and and go forward uh, but there's a lot of issues with that as well i mean i think uh, on the back end i i I know folks at uh, University of Southern California who have worked with U2, uh, sorry, 2U, uh, which is the top left in that. Uh, they, they would do this you know, seven year contract and do like an 80% to the vendor and then 20% to the school. And then after the seven years, you know, the, there's a conversation that happens about, do you want to renew or not? And they renegotiate the terms. And then if the school doesn't want to renegotiate the, the terms that are there because it's either not advantageous then the school then gets it's they're in a pinch because the programs and everything is kind of locked up behind the opm's uh, you know systems and so you're almost hostage i mean you, you almost have, have very little say and so when you do when you go down the opm route what i would say is a warning is you really are giving up a lot uh and your future with that and, and something that you need to really think through but some school, I mean, there's some of the, on the right-hand side of, the, of this table here, like the, um, uh, the specialists and, and some of the universities, OPMs, they, they are willing to kind of hand over, quote unquote, their program after they develop, but usually it's at, at a cost where, you know, you're essentially paying for it. And, you know, and again, that's a big upfront cost that some schools are not able to afford. So I, I will kind of just 
uh, put a, a lid there and move on. Here are some questions for you, you know, to consider at your school about you know, the infrastructure, about vendors, and also just the idea of you know, faith and technology. I, I pulled the slides out about that because I think there's still uh, faculty at some faith-based schools that are still resistant to online learning. And, and what I usually do is give my little theology of technology and online learning talk, and then ho hopefully that eases them uh, into it. So uh, let me talk about one more thing, and I'll take a, a break, and then we can kind of have a conversation, and I'll finish the last two uh, points. So instructional design is really, I would say, fundamental to online learning. Uh, this is, you know, when you shift learning to an online environment, uh, you're shifting the pedagogical, uh, the, the, you're shifting the pedagogy and also you're, you're really dealing with the technological affordances of what you're doing. And, and how do we uh, do this well, I think is really the, the, the big question. So what instructional design is, for those who are not familiar with the concept and may not have instructional designer at your campus. So what, what they basically do is they take instruction uh, of how a course is done and they, they, they kind of put it through a process of like, no, how, what are the learning outcomes? Um, what are the assessments that happen, like that need to happen to kind of make sure that students are getting to those outcomes? And then, and then finally, what are the content, sort of the backwards design of, of how we build, and which is very different than how a traditional course is built. If you talk to most professors and most campuses, what they would say is, well, you take the textbook and you look at you know, the chapters and you, you know, chapter one to two, are, are week one and chapter three to four are week two and they kind of you start with the content and then they work backwards and they they end up with oh, okay so here are the tests I'm going to do and then hopefully magically students will achieve their outcome uh, which in online learning cannot happen like that because everything has to be very well laid out or else your students most likely will not get to the outcomes that you intend and and so there are important considerations you know, when, you, when it comes to designing for online. So I have here on the top row, the affordances, and then the, the bottom row here, the design considerations. So um, one of the, the big, big affordances is this idea of anytime, anywhere, and, uh, and I'd say any device, uh, is that learners now, because of online learning, they can access content wherever they are. And so one of the things that we need to start thinking about in our design is, uh, are we building for mobile first? Uh, if you go back to the slide earlier about how students, especially the low income minority students, the only computing device uh, they may have is their mobile phone, uh, which is scary to think about. And imagine reading your, your, all your assignments and doing your, your essay and everything on your mobile phone. But that's actually a reality for some of the students that, you know, that we're seeing right now in, in terms of what's happening in COVID. And so if your instruction, if your, your courses are not designed for mobile first, and that's a problem because and then, you know, I don't know if you've ever done this PDF, trying to view PDFs on a mobile device with a very small uh, screen size. You have to keep going left and right, up and down. It just, it gets dizzying and I, I, it's frustrating for me and I don't have to do it. You know, it's not my only means, but sometimes I'm stuck with only a phone and have to read documents and it just, it's a very frustrating experience. There's also the idea of you have to do chunking, you know, that uh, you can't just upload, you know, 20 pages of stuff into one sort of page of the LMS and expect students to be able to understand and grasp what you want out of it. You have to break it off. You have to, you know, and then the, the idea of learning control is, is key here that because online allows sort of this asynchronous nature, you have to um, create the learning in a way that allows the students to pause. It's kind of like a video. They can pause, they can speed it up, they can slow it down. They can do the different things with it, the content, so that it kind of accommodates their way of learn, their pace, their way and their pace of learning. Uh, there's also this uh, consideration when, when it comes to content. And I alluded to this earlier. Uh, when you have low bandwidth, uh, and, and you know, like sort of limited device, uh, if you have a lot of videos and a lot of images that are high kind of processing power required, it's gonna be a problem for some students. Uh, I mean, not many students in the US. I, when I was doing this um, webinar for the international audience, uh, you know, folks in the Philippines, uh, folks in, you know, in Ghana, folks in um, uh, Indonesia, oh, actually not Indonesia, it was um, uh, Thailand. I mean, some of the, the countries where there's limited or unreliable internet access, 
they said, we just can't do a lot of media because you no know, students don't have a lot of data. And if I ask them to watch a you know, 20 minute video that may consume all their data for the month. And, and so that's something I need to consider. And so I think very, very true. You know, you have to really think about, you know, how, how, what kind of uh, content are you using and how will you make that available you know, to your students? And maybe a video is an option uh, to a, a text, you know, making sure that you no know, students can't view this. There is a text complement or a text supplement to it. Uh, and the idea of universal learning is this sort of this basic design principle that you know, if you design things that are clear, that are the instructions are are very clearly laid out, then it will benefit not just sort of students who who may have like a, a learning disability, but it's actually going to be beneficial everybody or, or people who. And, and finally, this idea of multimodal learning. Um, Richard Mayer. Uh, M-E-Y-E-R is the sort of the godfather when it comes to multimodal learning. He has a book on, on this talking about how you design things when it comes to using images and text and audio and video and how those things kind of operate uh, in tandem to promote learning among the students. And then finally, Differentiated learning, or some, some some people nowadays call it personalized learning. Uh, this is something that's possible when it comes to online. Uh, uh, when you do online learning, students can, in some ways, go at their own pace and make that learning experience individualized to their own interests or their, their own um, pacing. And this is where having you know, different pathways and how you design your course. Uh, conditional release is a, a technical term in some learning management systems where you can build, you know, like different, it's almost like pick, choose your own adventure uh, in how it's, you know, stories are you choose you know something and pat this pathway is for like you no know, it will take you uh to 10 different uh windows of content and this pathway takes you to five and this one only takes you to three and it's the three most essential because you know you are very experienced or you, you bring with you some prior learning experience and so things like that are important and it's part of the design considerations and obviously accommodation, you know, like when, when you have videos, you know, things like uh, captioning and, and things like that are important for some students that, you know, either English is not their first language or maybe they have, you know, their, their death or their hard of hearing that it's hard to them to just get the audio part. Um, Addy is a, a very popular mo design model that people use when they're designing online learning. There are you know, at least a dozen, if not more, types of uh, different instruction design models that are used. You know, there's the backwards design I described earlier, where you start with the outcome, and then you go to the assessment, and then you go to the content, and then you kind of build courses that way. Uh, there's also you know, the Dick and Carey model. There's the iterative design. I mean, there's so many of these different models. But I'd say Addy is probably one of the most popular, and it's something that uh, if you haven't thought about in terms of you know, instructional design for you know for your courses in general, but especially for online, this is something that is important to consider. Um, some resources here. Um, Arizona State University is has been doing a, a just amazing job at sharing the resources, especially since COVID-19. Uh, they in this particular website, teachingonline.asu.edu, and you can go there and you know specifically that um, page, course design page. It kind of walks you through a lot of the things that I talked about. So if you have faculty who you know want to learn more, if you want to learn more, if you're the leader for your campus and and you haven't really dealt with instruction design, I encourage you to kind of look there and, and sort of get glean some of that information and, and understanding of how to do this and, and do this well. So um, here are just some basic questions. And so what I would do is maybe uh, stop there and just have a conversation um, about uh, some of the things that we talked about. And let's now open it up. So uh, we talked about you know the first three things: you know, leadership, technology, instruction design. So let's uh, maybe start with: Are there any chat questions that have been posted, Andrew? Um, let's see. There's a question from Dale Green, um, and so he says: When the libraries and community centers are shut down last semester, it really crippled minority and poorer students. Most institutions did not consider this consequence moving of to a remote model because of COVID-19. Public access, public libraries is an equalizer for underserved populations. What can be done to fix this problem? Um, yeah, let's talk about that. Um, and, you know, our schools dealt with that pretty extensively. 
and we actually get a good number of students who are who start off taking in content through mobile or tablet and I'm of the opinion that um, you know mobile and tablet are fine for consumption um, but anything that requires extensive learning it's a problem if that's their primary device like you you are severely crippling the student because if you imagine typing a uh you know five or ten page paper using that tiny keyboard <laughs> and you know there's like brutal typos what we've started to do um during COVID 19 is we find you know highly affordable uh chromebooks and you know it's been a little bit tricky during COVID 19 um to to find them because everyone needed them but um, for this past term, we found the best source was Walmart and they had them for 80 bucks. Um, you know, the key thing that you need is you need a keyboard. Um, the, the keyboard is a radical difference than a tablet. So a lot of our students, they really want to get, you know, uh, an Android tablet or an iPad and they'll buy an iPad and they think they're going to do all their stuff, their, all their homework on it. And it just isn't the same. You know, they, they keep turning in papers and you got a five page paper with a hundred typos in it. And um, so, you know, I think that that's, um, that's, a, a, that's how we've been approaching it, but I don't know what other people have done. Um, and Daryl, I don't know if you can speak to anything that you've tried to do to address that um, with your students. You can unmute yourself if you want. Um, I think you're, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. For, you guys, you did a great, you did a great job. Um, I, I think it's I think it's a problem. I think I didn't I didn't really think about it until my students started saying I got my internet is jacked up. I can't I can't do anything with it. And that's I'm really trying to figure because my assumption was all my students are going to be safe. All they got to do is go to a public library. That was my solution. And when they shut that down, I, I mean I'm really kind of stuck now. Uh, I was thinking maybe a hot spot, but I mean if you if you can't get Starbucks open, McDonald's is shut down. I'm just saying, I mean, Lord, you know, poor students is don't, I really don't have a chance. I just, I was just trying to see if you guys have a solution. I, I actually have to go to another meeting. So I just, I was just trying to, I, I just wanted to tell you, you did a, you've done a great job in putting this together, Mike. Yeah. Thanks, Daryl. I'll, I'll share this slide with you. And I would recommend that you go back to the Keep Amer Keeping America Connected. I can't remember the website, but that's a great mm -hmm. website. It, it does a pretty good job in listing all the available resources at the national, state, and local level. And you can, mm -hmm. I think, do search by uh, zip code. And so, but mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, different states have also have similar initiatives where they try to provide. I, I know in California, and at least in Northern California, I read about is uh, the some of the, the school, or actually some of the cities provided uh, free hotspots for some of the lower income families um, during you know, this period of time so they can go to their, I don't know, city hall, wherever they can sort of check out one and make that available for their family, so. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the, the E-rate um, discounted internet access is also pretty helpful, but the problem is, you know, during COVID, you know, it takes two months to get your internet connected. So, you know, your term's <laughs> over by the time it happens. Um, and, you know, we actually had a good number of our students that were going to libraries and things along those lines. And, um, you know, they just took the term off, um, you know, yeah. for, for that period. But we worked with them to try to get them back on. And, you know, an $80 Chromebook is about the same as a textbook, you know? So if a student can't take a course because of an $80 Chromebook, you might as well, I mean, we just said, we'll buy you the Chromebook and then we'll work it out. You know, we'll get the money back at some point. Um, so it's what we did with the student um, is what we were offering. And that student ended up dropping anyway because for other reasons, but we, that, that's what we are trying to do um, yeah. in that case. So I don't, I don't know if there's anyone else on the call who's had innovative solutions um, on, you know, students who, who either run into problems with having a, a computer or internet access. Andrea, I, I'm curious to hear from you about sort of the situation um, in Trinidad. Uh, what, what's that like in terms of technology access and, and, and access to computing devices? You're, she's oh, muted. You have to unmute. It's uh, Sorry, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm on mute too. Um, what is interesting, you know, access is a, is a big issue. Um, Trinidad perhaps is just a little piece of the pie because we're uh, at the bottom of, a, of the chain of the Caribbean islands. And um, across the Caribbean, access and equity are always issues when it comes to technology. And, and it doesn't matter if you go as high up the food chain as you want in terms of um, coming all the way up to higher education. I think the problems are, are all similar. And we all went into this emergency mode that, um, that you spoke about, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was where everyone went. But the tremendous problem was what do you do with the 40% or the, as much as 60% of the, of the learning population that does not have access to decent devices? Because yeah. as, you, as you so well described, the question of doing, your, doing your, your, all of your assignments, et cetera, on a smartphone, it doesn't cut it. Mm -hmm. um, I sit on a board of management, and this is where my interest in this online learning um, webinar came in. I sit on the, on the board of education of the West Indies School of Theology. And we have, over the years, we've, we've had some courses online, and now we almost, we're fully online simply by way of emergency and COVID. And um, I have not heard a discussion as yet on the question of access, mm -hmm. although we know it's not uniform across the, across the country. Um, and um, as a matter of fact, our enrollment went up for, this, for, the, for the, the, this semester, which started in May. You know, interestingly, and we thought, okay, this is something's <laughs> happening here. We read it as the, the question of people having the asynchronous nature of the courses, the fact that people could come in wherever they were at so that it was no longer a question of having to travel, to travel pretty long distances. But I do believe that for adult education, it might be easier because uh, each adult or individual, ha it's a question now of affordability um, for the adult as opposed to lower down. I think the problems are universal. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I actually have a slide here that I did for the other webinar that showed, uh, it was from um, UNESCO that showed, I think on average, so there were 1.8 billion students that were impacted by COVID-19, mm -hmm. so 1.8 billion, and only 50% uh, you know, internationally had access, reliable access to their internet and the computing devices. That means now half, no, like point of uh, 900 uh, billion students, basically when COVID-19 happened, had just the, the reliability to uh, uh, sort of continuity in their education just stopped, mm -hmm. um, which is no big, big, you know, half that's, that's, yeah, that's a big number. So um, oh, maybe I want to shift the conversation a little bit and ask uh, if you guys have any thoughts about leadership um, for online learning at your school. Uh, whether you play a leadership role or you, you know, there's a lack of it or where, where is that in your campus? And I'd like to hear some of that from you guys. And you need to unmute if you want to share. Uh, I could share briefly. Um, we are a hundred percent online school and uh, just to go back for a second, um, the issue of access is huge uh, because how do you do this if somebody doesn't have access? So, I mean, that is a huge problem, and I think we all just keep looking to the Lord for solutions for that. <clears throat> but, um, uh, but in terms of leadership, what we found is um, that uh, we, we make everyone aware of this is online and we have to do things a certain way because you're not going to see the student face to face. And so everything has to be built around that and support it from the way the courses are designed to the way the teachers interact and the way that the support of, you know, the registrar and technology assistance and all of that helps the students. So um, I, and in my thinking, it has to be, not just a department, but um, kind of holistic in terms of the way students are approached and related to and helped um, in their online education. Yeah. 
I'll, I'll cover a little bit in the next part talking about sort of the role of faculty, you know, what sort of preparation and, and just sort of helping them along to be more effective in the online environment, because I think that's something that is, um, is still a challenge, even for some online schools. Uh, so. Hey, Mike, this yeah, is James. James. Yeah. Um, you know, I think um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not sure I, if everybody on here is on the faculty side or more. I know we have one person. I know um, that uh, Andrea was saying she's from the uh, uh, administrative side as well. But I think when you look at online and leadership, it's um, the philosophical change and what the um, student that you're engaging with as a leader, um, what is the value you're creating for what they're paying for their product? And I think what runs into is if you're a face-to-face -face large university, they're paying for an experience. So when you start, so I'm at a community college right now. Uh, we're seeing an increase in um, enrollment because things are looking to go online because our cost per credit hour for students is way less than a state school or a private school. So I think that plays into a determination of how the leadership looks at online and how that's going to play in the financial model of that institution. Um, so if you're an institution, I mean, I know Andrew and then Mr. Reeves, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what your first name, are already online totally. That, that's how their revenue is. That's how they look at it from a revenue standpoint. But if you're a large institution, unless you're Grand Canyon who tried to go online, you know, 15 yeah. years ago to be the University of Phoenix of Christian schools, it's hard to make that, large shift in um, operations to say, yeah, online needs to play a significant role, but that means we have to reevaluate how much we charge and what the value is for that student. And if we can't charge that much, are we going to be around? I mean, I, I hate to say it because higher education is about educating students and getting them to improve their life. But there's an economic model to that as well. And I don't know if a lot of leaders want to take that chance yeah and and do that because then you're shifting and saying if it's online like it, with the uh, mr reese had said from a standpoint of um how you in, interact with the student online that means a lot of your student life stuff goes out the door because you don't need that cost anymore yeah. you don't need that and are you willing to do that thinking that'll never come back around or do you do you limit it so those are all factors that I've seen, I, I'm not on senior leadership, I'm like in that, in between mid-management and senior, I'm right in that, yeah. I guess that abyss of it, where I get to hear from both sides, but I think that's stuff that's always in discussions. It's a lot easier on a community college level, but from a, uh, on a large scale, like uh, a major mid-sized Christian university, those are things you have to really put into um, yeah. thought, so. Yeah, I mean, just a quick uh, insight from APU, and you know this, James. Like, uh, our online programs cost the same as our on-ground program. Correct. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. No. <laughs> but I guess, like you said, there was an economic model, and for them, online is just another revenue stream that they need to maximize. And so they say, why not charge the same prices on-ground? And, and again, it's not it just it has not been thought out well and that's where it you know it. <laughs> well you know one of the issues i think is if you have different price points then you cannibalize yourself and you know there's a reason why you know the company that owns the gap and the banana republic and uh they own old navy yeah. they have different stores even though yeah. they own all of them yeah. Because if you see a five dollar, you know, T-shirt <laughs> next to a hundred and fifty dollar T-shirt, yeah. you're you're kind of sitting there thinking, what's going on here? And yeah. you know, the hundred and fifty dollar T-shirt doesn't sell as well, right? Yeah. So right. I think that that's part of the problem. And you know, I mean, all this gets into disruptive innovation theory, and you know, mm -hmm. fundamentally, yeah. everything's different whenever you go to online. And you know, part of what I think is going to be interesting once this is all said and done. Um, you know, Apple, for them to cross the chasm, they had to have physical stores, the Apple store. And mm -hmm. I think that online, part of online crossing the chasm, um, you know, 
if you look at what's happening with Western governors and some of these big, you know, Purdue Global, um, you know, once they get to 100,000 students, you know, they, they're putting up physical stores to support their <laughs> online learning, so to speak. And I think that increasingly hybrid or blended is going to become much more common. Mm -hmm. And, you know, trying to figure out what that looks like or, you know, having intensive. So, you know, I, I think where we'll go eventually is we'll probably still be 95% online, but we might, you know, I've been looking at the, the intensive model where you go and you do two weeks intensively somewhere, um, like my graduate, pro my doctoral program was. Um, and I think that, you know, that's part of where we're going to end up, I think, once we're done is that, um, but I think it's going to be easier for the online to add, you know, all the people who are uh, adding these physical campuses with 100,000 students, they, they're starting in the online space pr predominantly, and then they're adding physical campuses. Um, you know, it's little it's mini like the campuses. Amazon, it's the Amazon model where they start online and then they, they start buying up Whole Food and they start opening Amazon stores. And right, exactly. So I think it's going to be like that because it's easier to get the business model right and then add, you know, at that point, having a store becomes a feature mm -hmm. to your online product, right? So, yeah. but you know, I'm thinking something as I hear you all discussing it that in the Caribbean, I think we have to go through uh, some, uh, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a psychological lobotomy. I just, uh, to use a, 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 a kind of, I have to turn, I have to create that phrase. We have to change our minds about what learning is all about. Um, we have this thought that um, once we don't have mortar and bricks, it must be cheaper. So absolutely, if you're going to convert your university or you're going to convert your, your, your learning space into an online to, or transfer, transition onto an online modality, modality, a lot of your overheads are cut and therefore you should charge less. That's number one. And, um, and then, we, then we run into the question of, um, of numbers. Um, just as you said, the more, the more that we attract, because we are online, we attract more people and then we, then we have a notion that we need community. Now, community is what we struggle with when we have online classes. Long before I became an administrator in education, I was in the trenches and I taught online, um, online learning, through an online platform for universities. And one of the things I always found at the end of the perfect day, those students found each other, whether it is and because wherever they were in territories, geographical territories that they had in common, they met. Mm -hmm. They met physically and we began to recognize that community was important. And just as Andrew said, that this blended model just, you know, just might be the, the better thing, the better mm -hmm. way to go because whether we created a community or not, the community mushroomed yeah. and it seemed to be important. Yeah. So I yeah. think that's what, where we're going with our institution. That's where we may very well go. Okay, Mike, I'm, I'm going to let you, I know you have number four and five you haven't gotten yes. to, and I know we're, we probably have a little bit less time to go through those, but why don't you go ahead and jump yes. into those, sure. and then if we have time, we can do a little more discussion yeah. at the end. So. Well, thank you for that conversation. I think that's uh, really rich and, and informative. So let's talk about faculty training. So uh, this is a, uh, I cropped the, this result of a survey from, um, Titan Partners. You now they do a lot of surveys on you know, different uh, aspects of higher ed, and this one is you know, top faculty challenges during the transition to remote uh, teaching. So um, the the top, as you can see, the top uh, challenge they face is keeping my students engaged, uh, and then I would say the next one is providing additional supplemental remediation to students, and you can kind of see how those kind of, but it's that whole idea of engagement, and I'll, I'll actually talk a little bit more in the student side in terms of uh, what Andrea was saying earlier about community and the sense of present, uh, the, the, the social presence and connection. I mean, those are obviously important in an online setting, and how do we do that? Uh, 
in terms of some of the skill sets, I think that are important for teaching online and making it effective for the learning, the student learning experience. Uh, you know, this comes from uh, ASU. Uh, part of their, you know, their training, they have this uh, little infographic that kind of outlines the key parts. They talk about this idea of a, a faculty presence. You know, that making sure that you, you, when you teach online, I think those who have had experience teaching online, uh, if you're your instructor is not present in the sense that they're not responding to posts, they're not doing announcements, they're not sort of giving feedback, then that's a, that's like a, a vacuum. It's like, you know, you, you're there and you don't have any idea, like, am I learning? Do I, you know, like, there's no connection, there's no emotional connection to it. And so I think instructor presence is key, like, as it would be in a face-to-face -face classroom. And there's also this, you know, there's different aspects of making sure, you know, there's real world applications and then there's uh, expectations are clear, objective learning objectives are clear and um, feedback and so on so i think those are kind of all key pieces and i would say in uh in online uh in training for online faculty these are kind of the the, the must haves you know to to make sure that student that the faculty are understanding that these are the important pieces that make online learning very uh, uh, engaging and important for the students. Uh, again, I point to ASU, you know, this is going uh, up one, one um, a notch in their uh, teaching online website. You know, there's a learning toolkit that um, faculty can basically download and it kind of goes through all the different parts of different uh, ways of how to teach effectively and you know the faculty can kind of there's podcasts there there's um, I think uh, work, worksheets and, and rubrics and I mean just tons of, of content there that I you know, encourage you to either explore yourself or tell your faculty to explore uh, you know, obviously we can't talk about online learning uh, and faculty without sort of talking about standards and quality matters is one of those uh, standards nationally that is used actually it's an international organization now because they now have a lot of other countries adopting their model for how to essentially measure quality in the online course whether it's the program the administration the teaching or the content and it kind of goes through uh, there's you know they have uh, their quality matter uh, scorecards or, or rubrics that they use that you can basically use to kind of assess your own you know, program to see how uh, how you measure up to these standards uh, a comparable uh, organization would be the online learning consortium uh, they are a little bit more I would say in the, the education and conference and the, o, the QM is the more of this the standards organization the OLC does they do have standards they, they have this the scorecard which is their the big um, uh, resource but they also have conferences they also have you no know, uh, webinars they also have you know just lots of resources they, they have two or three journals so Again, a great resource I would I can't uh, recommend highly enough. So it's just you know, lots of good stuff. And schools can be part of the OLC for relatively cheap. I think for a size like APU, uh, we only pay $1,500 a year and we have access. You know, if you become a member, you, know, you can kind of get discounts on their webinars and other resources that are only limited to members. So, uh, so some quick questions about you know uh, faculty training making sure you know the faculty their general attitudes and are in check and best practices and also just support that they may experience and then finally i want to talk about student uh, support and the student experience uh, so the most challenging aspects of COVID-19 for students, as you can see there, uh, number one was the separation from friends, which is funny if you think about it uh, on the one hand, like it has nothing to do with academics, but then at the same time, it has everything to deal with that whole experience that we've been talking about, about the community, what it, why, why people go to school in a physical place, because you now they have friendships and communities they have connected and developed, and that's where, you know, for them, they they face the greatest sort of disruption is, you know, their separation from friend. And also you know, the second one is on-site classes moving online. I mean, that was a disruptive experience for a student. You know, some, some people have argued, oh, students, you know, the millennials and the digital folks, I mean, they, they shouldn't have a problem, but no, they do because, you know, they may be using a lot more technology, but they're not necessarily uh, used to learning in that uh, modality. And that's where I think that disruption uh, happens. And then also impact on class schedule. Um, this is something more related to logistics. When faculty 
you know, had to kind of move their things online. Uh, they started changing the times when they, they met and when they did synchronously, which is a problem because if, you know, in a face-to-face -face classroom, when you're scheduled for 10 to 11, you're there and there's no other class happening. But then when you start going online, you move your class time, then you're moving and you're maybe conflicting with other classes that may have also either been there or they moved their class. And so it just it caused a lot of issues. I, I know we, we faced some of those issues at APU when this was happening. So we told faculty, do not change your class time if you're going to hold synchronous class because no, if you do, then it's because messed up everything for a lot of other students. So, uh, and the likelihood of students learning online in the future. Uh, this um, uh, was a, another survey, it's a national survey, and they, they looked at sort of their attitude, you know, after having gone through the experience, you know, what are sort of their students' perspective about the future. And so what they found was that uh, students are fairly balanced. I mean, you know, a third of the students say that they're more likely to, get to learn online in the future. And then a, uh, you know, a third of them say they're less likely, and then you know, a third is just sort of neutral. And so it's interesting that you know, COVID-19 has not really sway them one way or another. Um, it's just, you know, it's, just, you know it, it's like a third, a third, a third is sort of what I, I see. Um, this. In terms of some of the characteristics of how to be successful as an online student, and, and some of you are very familiar with this, um, there's lots of literature written about this. You know, why why is there such a high you know dropout rate, and um, you know, especially in some of the you know populations that we look at, you know, and and some of the the reasons why are some you know it's listed here. You know, uh, and to the right you see the access to internet. We talked about computer ownership, and it's a good study environment. Uh, I remember. Uh, there were a lot of conversations locally here at APU about uh, students who had to move home who may not have their own room or some sort of quiet set environment. They just weren't able to succeed as, uh, as well because, you no, know, they had you no, know, like even right now, sometimes I struggle. I have two kids doing summer school. I have a kids doing summer school, another room, and I have another two kids. One's on Khan Academy. And uh, sometimes there's a lot of noise and it's just, it's hard to focus and hard to do work. And so imagine if you're a student and you're taking a full load and you just don't have a place where you can go to do your work. That's a problem for a lot of students in, when it comes to online learning and you know, among the other skills that are needed. Um, there's you know, this study I just, you know, I think some of you are familiar with. This is the um, Department of Ed a couple years ago, actually it's been a decade now, uh, did a meta study and l looked at sort of the different studies of what the best modality is and they found that you know, um, the hybrid is really the ultimate, you know, what we've been talking about is the best model for improve the, you know, student learning experience, you know, and um, it's just, you know, it's the best of all worlds. You know, you have all well, the affordances of online, but you also get the sort of face-to-face -face benefits as well. Uh, but with all studies, there's also, you know, counter studies. And this is where they say, well, let's wait and you know, not make a wide sweeping conclusion. Instead, we need to think about sort of the, the different segments of the population. And this is where they say disadvantage online learning disadvantages low income and underprepared students and and there's also studies that you know show that it's minority online students also don't do a, a fair as well when it comes to online learning um, this is a, a book i recently read that i would recommend anybody kind of think about you know um, community development online in general and faith and spiritual formation online um, Mary and Stephen Lowe. Mary Lowe is, in, uh, I think, overseas an organization called, I think, Access. It's a higher ed, Christian higher ed online conference they, um, they do every year. I attended one when it was at Biola uh, a few years ago. And, and basically, they argue that the, there's this sort of econ, ecological model you know, of how we can think about spiritual growth and that it actually can happen in online, that you can create these authentic communities uh, in an online environment the same way you do on, on campus. Uh, and we can actually all see this recently, you know, churches and small groups and Bible studies. I mean, I think all of us are experiencing this in the U.S. Uh, and maybe elsewhere where you know, my church has actually done 
quite well in the online space. Uh, I, their attendance overall has gone up. Now they have you now people coming, joining in from all over the country, if not all over the world now, in a way that they didn't have before. And so I think uh, just I think we there's lots there to explore, and how do we continue to to leverage that modality in a way that will continue to grow uh, the community and the spiritual kind of uh, environment of, of what we're doing with our students. And then <clears throat> this is <clears throat> a, a collection of uh, writings about a uh, high flex model. This has been talked about a lot in recent uh, days. The high flex model was sort of pop. Uh, it, it, it got popular, it was written by a group of San Francisco State uh, University professors uh, maybe about 10 years ago and they put this uh, book together and it just gotten a lot of attention recently and a lot of the posts I've seen and read, they're kind of coming back to this over and over and over again and basically the, the idea is, you know, they're trying to create this um, high flex model where basically you have, uh, you know, the online activities but then you also have sort of the, the synchronous, so online asynchronous activities, and then you have the face-to-face the -face activity, and then uh, the, the sort of the synchronous online, and, and how do you kind of do all these different pieces and do them well? I think that's something that they, you know, they, they try to explain in the different chapters. So lots of great uh, things to draw from there as well. So uh, just some questions about, you know, uh, student support that for you to consider in your campus. Uh, I always love to recommend reading. So here are some uh, readings that uh, I always enjoy. So um, Richard Mayer's book I mentioned earlier. Uh, the e-learning is another book that um, <clears throat> is about online instructional design. And then you know, Building Inter the Intentional University. That's actually a great book. Uh, I read this you know, about a year ago. It's the building of the Minerva uh, school that's the one that's fully online but they have they have students live in communities around the world every semester students live in a different uh, um, global city and in the end of four years the students would have uh, just these amazing international experience and then their whole online content is done on you know in their platform and they meet with their their teachers online and it's just it's really i think a uh, innovative model that i think more schools will start to to look to, and then um, you know the other the Joseph I I, I own about sort of the future of, of technology and how it impacts higher education and Will and Bowen's uh, higher ed in uh, in the digital age, and then finally it's a technology uh, in in the Bible. So so let's um, we have what fifteen minutes left. <clears throat> um, let's have a conversation for you know, anybody have uh, follow-up questions or anything they want to address so thank you Mike that was uh, helpful I you know especially those books at the end I'm like man I, I wish more of them were on audiobook because I don't have enough time to read them all <laughs> um, the um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in learning more about hybrid. Um, I think that, I think it's going to be a common ground. Um, so help me understand this book about the hybrid course design. Um, I mean, if someone wants to imp implement hybrid courses, would that be your go-to book? Yeah, well, okay, so let me, uh, so the high flex model, <clears throat> let me kind of give you a little more details about that. So um, I think what the high flex model first and foremost is about is giving students choice. Uh, and you know, this is relating back to learner control. Um, so students actually in this model, so first of all, from the administrative and from the faculty perspective, it's a lot of work because you have to basically prepare your lesson to be offered online, in person, uh, online, in person, asynchronous and synchronous. And so you almost have to prepare your, your lesson to be available in all those modalities. And then what the students, what then from the student's perspective is that they actually get to choose the model. Like they, it's almost like a, 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 a la carte model. Like this week, because no, I'm, I'm sick. I'm just gonna do the whole thing online synchronous. And that's what I'm gonna do because that, no, I can't, I can't go to school because I'm sick, whatever. Or next week, cause I'm working a lot of hours, I can do the online asynchronous 
and then I might join a synchronous meeting. And so it's, so I think at the heart of this is sort of the, the idea of student choice and to be able to create these different ways of offering learning for students. I mean, it, it takes a lot of work, but at the same time, I think, you know, when you're talking about how um, in the, the, the education industry, Oftentimes, it's not student-centered. It's actually administration or faculty-centered, and that makes it problematic because now it's what's good for the faculty or for what's good for the school and not for the students. Um, does that make sense? That yeah, of- yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that's kind of like you know the holy grail of a course, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it does sound like that would be hard. I, I just I finally found the book because I was looking it up on Amazon, and, and I realized it's actually available for free online. Yeah, it's OER. Um, it's an yeah, OER. yeah. So that that's that's good to know. Um, so, other people who have questions about this section. Um, my question has to do with availability of the video when it's done, because I think that. I would love to be able to go back over some of the stuff that, because some of it you did pretty fast. I'd yes. like to go back over the infographics and so on. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll post this to the CHIA website. So Christian Higher Education and Innovation Alliance website. Okay. Um, I think Mike's gonna take yeah. the recording and, and put it on YouTube and then link it in, into that. Yes, yep. I'll, I'll make sure. And then uh, I will also email it out to those who have registered so you'll have access to it directly and then I'll share the slides too so you can look at all the resources. Lovely, thank you. I thanks, Mike. I enjoyed it. Um, on a graduate year, um, I don't know if this is hybrid, but um, I was teaching graduate org development when uh, we had to move to uh, online. And uh, our, if I would have taught it synchronously, it'd have been a four-hour class. Mm-hmm. And and I was like, first of all, I didn't want to put my students through a four-hour uh, teaching or you know just being online for four hours and i didn't want to be online for four hours Mm. um i do a podcast what i happen to find and this was more talking with students um um, to say hey here are some ideas what's going to help you i was able to put together two one and a half hour podcasts with people outside of the class on the subject we're talking about Mm. so then it allowed the students to listen to them during the week instead of writing, they actually, uh, and this is something I already put up, instead of writing like some of the things that impacted them in their, uh, what they read and everything during the week, it was, uh, they had to do a YouTube video, so it got used to being able to present online. Yeah. But then our class was only an hour, and it actually turned into an hour and a half because they talked so much, an hour and a half meeting, because they say, hey, these are things that came out of, out of the um, podcast that they listened to, and we're able to connect that to what their readings were. So, that's just a little bit of hybrid. And I started talking and saying, boy, that'd be much more enjoyable for the student as opposed to sit through four hours of in class yeah. to be able to um, do that. But the issue then comes up with, I have, my wife works at APU and she's graduate admissions counselor, but used to be in international admissions. Yeah. There's so much face time an international student has to have in the class. Yeah. So now we pl- now you fall into to that category. So. Um, I, I loved everything you said, but these are all the little minute things now that we have to take into consideration for an international student that comes to the United States to, um, to learn how, how does that play into with their visas and everything like, depending on the visa that they have here. So, yeah. Yeah. Mike, I, I recently said my general advice to someone on, uh, you know, course design is anything that doesn't need to be. Uh, synchronous, you should re- pre-record. Would you agree with that, or do you think that I'm overstating it? Um, because, you know, there's certain things you can't do, um, but like lectures, anytime I have a lecture, man, I'm going to pre-record it and just have them listen to it, and then let's discuss it. Um, but uh, yeah, tell me, Mike, wh- what's your philosophy on that? So I, I agree with you for the most part. I think uh, when it's content that you can consume, it's like a book, you know, I would say it's like course content, uh, putting it on and, and like recording it and you know, like a podcast, what James is talking about or, or doing a video, like talk over that. 
that is great. I think, you know, and I think with just with that one caveat with that is making sure that you chunk it, you know, so that it's like not a two hour thing that they have to, you know, there's like smaller parts, you know, 20 minutes or 10 minutes or something like that. So yes, I think any kind of course content can be put into a asynchronous format that you can do it. Um, but when you do that, what happens is you cannot sort of assume that students will get that content just because you know, they, they now have it asynchronously. It's sort of like telling students to read an article and then assuming they understand everything about the article. I mean, they're still gonna be, that's what the role of the teacher is important is that they, they're there to help them process and to redirect them and their understanding. And, and without the, the synchronous interactions, uh, I you know in my experience, and you know, I've taught online synchronous and, and, and asynchronous, and I can tell you that without that synchronous piece, there's so many moments when students just missed it, and I didn't know as a faculty that they missed it because I assumed like I gave them the lecture, I gave them the reading, how come they're not like they're, the paper they write, they're just like totally off, and, and I think that's where the synchronous it still has to kind of weave in the content in one way or another so that you're, you're kind of doing that check on, on understanding. Um, and so the, the, I think would say that, that when, yes, you can do the asynchronous piece, but then when you have the synchronous meeting, it's about you do have to do some checking and, and making sure that the students are getting the content. Uh, and then also processing. It's one thing to read it and understand it and, and you know, sort of the balloons taxonomy, the lower levels, like the knowing and, and, and sort of recalling, but then how do you go up to the analysis and then the synthesis and, and the creation of new knowledge. That, that's where it, you, you really have to do synchronous, interactive kind of stuff to do that. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Um, I want to ask a question about your chief online learning officer position within a tertiary institution, because, you know, um, across the education sector, we, we always talk about the headmaster, the principal, the person who is the CEO of the plant being the chief learning officer. Um, but, at this, so, so I, but I'm hearing now a chief online learning officer who may not necessarily be the president or the CEO. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the Chloe report, uh, is the one that basically is advocating for this chief learning, chief online learning officer uh, role because they're they're saying that that online learning is becoming such a you uh, because of the technology, because of the the policies and standards and learning design. There's so many pieces to it that if you don't have a senior leader uh, advocating or supporting that kind of learning it's just not going to be done well in a university and, and that's where uh, i think the value of that kind of role is that they're really the first and foremost they're an advocate but then more than that they are there to ensure that the infrastructure is sound that the faculty are trained that the curriculum are well built that the, the student support are there and 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 as we all know i mean face-to-face -face support for faculty and students are, uh, is very different than online because now i think faculty I mean, like I, I've been, you know, our office here at APU, and I, we do faculty training. We used to do a lot. Of, we still do a face to face, but we also do online. And we can tell you, uh, there are different. There are some faculty that insist on face to face. Like they want you there. They want you to show them how, what button to press, and how. And they just can't do this webinar thing for whatever reason. It is, it's like a, they're allergic to it. And uh, and, and some, same thing with the student support. Like there's some services that are just not available to online students at this point at, at APU. And, um, you know, they can do tutoring, they can do library, they can do counseling. But then when it comes to other kinds of, you know, services they may need, it just, it, you know, it's missing, absent. Uh, so, yeah, I think a senior leader, is someone who's sort of making sure all these pieces are in in place and that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Okay, thank you. All right, anything else from folks? Um, if not, thank you, um, Mike. Um, this has been really helpful. I learned a lot um, from yeah. this and I, I'm sure a lot of other people have um, I want to read all those books and you know look at, read the reports and you know part part of you know the purpose of Christian Higher Education Innovation Alliance is I, I said at the beginning we're a diffusion of innovation group 
And, you know, Mike is at the cutting edge on a lot of these things on instructional design and on, um, you know, online teaching best practices. And what he's doing is he's helped diffusing the, that innovation, you know, to us. And each of us is kind of diffusing innovation in our own, you know, you're at the cutting edge of, uh, you know, things in Trinidad and Tobago and Granada Granada and you know other places so you know that that's a part of the purpose of Chia is to to do that and to share the learning um, that we're all you know we all have um, so that we can um, increase access to Christian higher education much more widely um, yeah so Mike thank you for your generosity and sharing all this and um, you know, I guess we'll see what the fall turns out, you know, yeah. that everyone, everyone <laughs> has their plan A for the fall and, and you need a plan A, but you know, most people are going to be on plan C, D, E, or F yeah. by the time the fall <laughs> happens. Um, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I, I, the, the, the one plan that I've heard that seems like the, actually the most realistic for the fall is, um, I've seen one school that said, we're going to start in, in, uh, the fall in person, you know, kind of what you're saying with all these contingencies, yeah. but come November for Thanksgiving break, we're just sending people home yeah. and we're just going to assume that what happened this term is going to happen then. Yeah. And we're not even going to pretend that we're going to go all the way to December. So yeah. Yeah. Um, that, I think that's that actually that's, what APU did. Uh, is okay, doing. good. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I think that's wise because I think that, yeah. um, you know, if the state doesn't shut a school down before then, yeah. like, you know, happened in the first shutdown, That'll, that'll mitigate some of the issues. So I think that, that seems like a wise approach. So Can I throw this out? I know we only have a minute left, but what I think is funny is uh, it, from an innovation standpoint, we're, we're reacting and this is how we're to, um, how we're to do the school year, but ending by Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. But has anybody actually sat there and thought, maybe this should be the new model because who really wants to learn <laughs> and are active between, in, in all seriousness, between yeah. Thanksgiving and Christmas or oh, Thanksgiving yeah. and you know, end of January. Yeah. Why don't we now flip it? And maybe that's where the major break is. Yeah. And then the summer where you can have one month. I mean, you only do so much surfing and lying on the bed, that lying on the beach during right. the summer. Yeah. How many, how much more do people talk about being with family during the holidays? So I, yeah. I, I just sit here and listen going, is anybody going to be brave enough to say, you know, we're just going to start in the middle of January, middle of July or end of July. And we're to yeah. end in November, yeah. give them uh, those times off, and then we'll kind of start up again. Yeah. Well, I think there's going to be a lot of things that change, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be interesting to see where we, we end up. But hopefully, that would be great, having a much longer, you know, winter break. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see, we you know. Go down, all could go down to Granada and Trinidad and, yeah. Trinidad and enjoy, enjoy that when it's yeah. all winter here. Wear okay. some all year long. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. All right. Well, thank Come you, everyone. Time,